I might have you again return to page 263 in the front of your hymnal and look at that Psalm 100. Again, the basis for the sermon today. There are four verses and there are four points to the text. It's kind of simple, basic Christian truth that this word proclaims to us today. <laughs> we have entered the political season. You are starting to see ads. You're going to see them for an awful long time. I know it just turns you into the tank. With me. <laughs> anyway, I saw one of those ads recently and in, in thinking of the sermon for this week. And it was by uh, Tim Scott, the senator from South Carolina. He made a very simple statement. And it was four points, and I knew there were going to be four points in the sermon today, and that's why I remembered it. And I hope you can remember the four points of the sermon today. But he, in his ad, he was talking about individual responsibility. If you're old enough, get a job. If you borrow money, pay it back. If you commit a crime, you go to jail. Now, those were simple things that almost anybody hearing that ad could understand, right? Doesn't have to, you know, uh, very clear and to the point. Well, there's four simple points in the sermon today. It begins in that first word with joy and celebration and praise, number one. Number two, identity, who you are. As a child of God. Number three, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And number four, the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. Again, praise, celebration, rejoicing. Number two, your identity. Number three, leads to constant thanksgiving. And number four, God is faithful. Now even the youngest person can understand those points. Coming back to point one, joyous celebration. As I was just reading that text and I and I, I should have printed it for you to read along with me. And from Romans, faith brings joy. And there are a number of times that that word is used in this text. Celebration, praise, overwhelming, what words would I use? Almost ecstasy at times because of what God has done. The, the phrase I heard a number of years ago, joy is a sure sign of the presence of God. Joy is a sure sign of the presence of God. Now, now, let me differentiate here from the happiness of the world. That's the kind of thing when you, you know, you maybe win the lottery. Joy comes from a deep personal relationship. When God has touched your heart and is now guiding your life. Joy isn't temporal, but the kind of joy that flows in Christian faith and life begins now and only expands until that day in the eternal presence of Christ in the kingdom of heaven. Joy is relational. Joy is a gift of God, and it is a gift of faith. Well, we aren't really good at joy, are we, in the Lutheran church? We always look like somebody just died. <laughs> well, we're kind of sad. You know, we aren't, you know, you go to some of the praise churches and they're moving and they're singing and they're dancing and they're alive and the, the spirits, you know, touching their hearts and there's, I've got the joy of Jesus deep down and it's moving today, brothers and sisters, and here we go. Oh, if I could only sing. Anyway, you know, we can get the spirit moving, but... There's a sense 
that that's so biblical. It's, it's a sign of God's activity in the lives of his people over the wonderful things that the Creator has done, over the just gracious and good things that Jesus has done, and that the Holy Spirit continues to draw people into his presence. And there's a pervasive joy. Um, there's a hymn in, in your green book, 551. A hymn, we, we've sung it a number of times here. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, praising thee, their son above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the gloom of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of God. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And then I have to admit that that many times I my joy seems to kind of drain away. Why does that happen? It's because I'm often looking at the wrong things, taking in the messages of the world. I'm looking at the brokenness. I'm looking at the sin. I'm looking at the hate. I'm looking at the you know all of the problems, and I'm not looking at the Lord. And when I lose that focus, then the joy kind of drains away. I get wrapped up all again in the problems, and the sorrow becomes a pervasive feeling of it. But if we can remember that God is involved in the now, that God was involved in the past, that God is involved in the future, and that God is the basis of our own present joy and eternal joy, then our spirits can truly laugh and sing and dance and there can be joy. So I went to the dentist this week. <laughs> it's the second time it's happened to be in my earthly journey, but I had one of my crowns come off. A piece of licorice this time. <laughs> Well, what'd you learn in the sermon Sunday? Well, the pastor's crown came. Anyway, um, as in the past, they just glued it back on, and I was going to go in 15 minutes. But in the time leading up to when the dentist came in, uh, the assistant was there. And I had talked to her quite a bit before uh, when I had some other dental work done earlier in the year. And uh, we were talking about a number of things. Uh, I think she's 62 and she's going to retire. And she's, well, she's got Parkinson's, so things are starting to go downhill. Oh, a whole bunch of things. But then she brought up her grandson. And her grandson had come up to her husband and asked ask about where something was in the Bible. He had heard about that at his church. And he wanted Grandpa to help him find that text. And so she and I were talking back and forward exactly what text the child was referring to. But Grandpa spent the time with his grandson and found the text. And they both read it together and talked about it together. Now, that was an example to me of great joy. A child coming to a grandparent, wanting to learn a little bit more about the Word of God. And when any child, you know, you've seen that in Sunday schools, in Bible schools, in Bible camps, when the Spirit touches them and draws them into the presence of Jesus, oh boy, is there a pervasive joy? Well, there is in my heart, I pray in your heart. And even as she shared that story with me, in light of, you know, her problems and other things we had talked about, the predominant feeling was joy. That a child wanted to learn more about Jesus. And Jesus would always bring great joy, living hope into the lives of his people. I hope that you and me 
both ask God to more focus on God, where we truly find joy and celebration, then so often as we do, we get stuck up in our problems and we, we end up kind of slipping away and becoming discouraged and more depressed. So first point, and the lesson is clear, our joy is in the Lord. But then as, as we go on in this text again, know that the Lord himself is God. He has made us and we are his. We are his people. So what does this verse remind me of? It reminds me of baptism. Because in baptism, the church says, God says, to the child, to the adult, you are my beloved child. You were created in my image. I have died for your sins. I am your present and ever-living friend, and I am your eternal destination. You are my beloved child, and you are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And it is this identity, as children of God, made in the image of God, for whom Christ died, that the Spirit has called us to faith into, that we walk daily with, and we journey toward our eternal connection in the kingdom of God. Primary identity for each of you and for me, <laughs> baptized believer in the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's who we are. We are Christian. We are believers in the triune God. We are servants of a living Christ. Children of God. Everything else is a passing fancy. Everything else is left behind at our passing. Children of God. Who we are. Created in his image walking in his daily guidance to our eternal home. That is who you are. Christian, child of God, baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, with the heart and the mind of a servant. Point three, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Many of you are daily and deep readers of scripture. And there is a predominant mood, thought, that comes out of the Apostles Paul's writings. Thanksgiving. Almost every letter begins with this. Thanks be to God for the gift of faith that I have in Jesus Christ. The grace has called me into the presence of the Master. And secondly, thanks be to God for you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether it's in Philippi or Thessalonica or Corinth or wherever, he's thankful that he has faith in Jesus, this one who is a persecutor, and thankful that he is not alone, but he walks through life with men and women, young and old, rich and poor, who are fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In a number of devotions that I've read recently, maybe you've read some of them too, it talks about some of them in portals of prayer, about being thankful even when times are tough. When a loved one dies, when a job is lost, when a marriage will not be restored, or when you've lost faith. And it talks about even being thankful in the depths of all the hurt you're going through. And, and you want to say, how can you do that? Why would that be? Because the thankfulness isn't around the event. 
It's around the God who's with you in the event. Thanks be to God that Jesus is with us, yes, when a loved one dies. Thanks be to God when there's a tragic accident and suffering will be for months or years. Not that any of these things happen, but that there is a God with us in the midst of them. And yes, one can be thankful, even in the midst of great sorrow and hurt. For we do not go through it alone, but we go through it with the guiding hand and presence of Jesus Christ. If you notice, Many times I will either end a sermon or thanks be to God for the gift of Jesus Christ. I thought on this part today, maybe I should just pass out a sheet of paper and put it in your boat in a blank sheet. But then I'd have to make sure you had a pen or a pencil. And then I'm not sure you'd do it. But then I, would, I wanted you to, you know, write down all the things that you're thankful for. You've heard me talk about that. I, that's always in my marriage sermon. I, I say to the couple, I want you on the day you're married. You're marrying this guy, you're marrying this gal, and you like them and you love them. For, now you write down all those things because I want you to put it in your wallet or purse because I'm going to tell you in six months or six years you're going to forget half of them. And you're going to focus on, she doesn't clean the house. You know, focus on the thankful things that you are. Well, I don't have that sheet of paper, but, and some of you might write them all on your phone and remember them that way as well. But I think that's a very appropriate thing to do, and not just the day you're getting married. Any day of your life, go down the list. Thanks be to God for the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for the gift of the Holy Catholic Church. Thanks be to God for the word of God. Thanks be to God that I can talk to God every day through prayer. Thanks be to God that I have brothers and sisters in the faith here at Servants of Christ and in other places. Thanks be to God that even when I have messed up, I hear that word given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God that even as I was at my mother's funeral, I heard the words, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Thanks be to God for the life I've been given, the faith that has blessed me, the church I live and move in, the future that is mine. Thanks be to God. It's a wonderful thing when Thanksgiving seeps out, even more so than when it seeps into it. Again, uh, you know, our, our hymnals, both the green, the blue, the new red one, there are so many hymns that are just pervaded with this idea of Thanksgiving. One we often sing uh, uh, many times in Thanksgiving services, 407. Come, you thankful people, come raise the song of harvest home. This talks about, you know, when the harvest is safely in. Another reason to be thankful, we have food. Thankful that we are citizens of a free country. Thankful. But should you get sick today, there will be a hospital to take you to. Come, you thankful people, come. Come daily, not just at Thanksgiving but every day of your life into the presence of God. Look at that hymn. Look at the others. Uh, you know, that, that 409, praise and thanksgiving. Father, we offer for all things living, created good. Bless the Lord the labor we bring to serve you, that with our neighbor we may be fed. Sowing and tilling, we would work with you. Harvesting, milling for daily bread. Thankful for the gift of work, no matter what your vocation is in this world. So much to be thankful for. Again, just like with joy, the 
problem comes is when we focus on what we don't have rather than what we have. And the most precious gift we have is Jesus Christ. Fourth point of the sermon as we go forward. Maybe this is the most important. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his faithfulness endures from age to age. He remains faithful even when we do not. Even when you mess up big time or forget for a long, a long time the presence of God, the promise of God, or to thank God. He never forgets you. He doesn't give up on you. He is always there for you. God is faithful. He created this world. He sent his son to die for your sins. You are guided day by day by the Spirit. God is faithful. It doesn't depend on you. It never did. It never will ultimately depend on you. That's good news. It all is a gift from a faithful God. A faithful God. A faithful God. A God we should never forget nor quit thanking. 731 in your blue hymnal this time. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. When my gray way grows dear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Faithful God, every step of the way, the last step into eternity, precious Lord, lead me home. He will. He is faithful. He is your Lord, our Savior. And I want to say it again. Thanks be to God for the gift of Jesus Christ.